Joining me now from Paris is Azade Kian Thibault. She is the director of the Center for Gender and Feminist Studies at the University of Paris. In Washington is Holly Dagers. Holly is a non-resident fellow with the Atlantic Council. She's also the editor of their Iran Source blog. And still with us from the University of Tehran, Setra Sadegi, a PhD student in American Studies and also in the studio, Serhan Afajan, coordinator at the Center for Iranian Studies in Ankara. Uh, Azadeh, can you just take us on a trip down memory lane? Talk us through what Iran was like in the 1970s, not in the few years just before the revolution, but in the early 70s. Paint a picture for us. Well, actually, when it comes to rural areas, because one should not forget the majority of the population back then was the ruler, I think that the rural population suffered uh, from um, illiteracy. And the fact was that the majority of the villages, for instance, did not have drinking water or electricity. And a lot of migrants, rural migrants, uh, uh, to the big towns, including Tehran, uh, whose uh, population, uh, for instance, was doubled. Uh, from the 1960s to 1970s, and these people lived in shanty towns uh, in uh, uh, big cities. So uh, then it comes, when it comes to uh, uh, urban areas, uh, on the contrary, uh, we could see the emergence uh, and uh, uh, expansion of modern uh, middle classes uh, who uh, were very well formed either in uh, Iranian universities or, or abroad. They would become technocrats. Uh, uh, in the administration, and then we had also a strong uh, private uh, sector uh, because the Shah's uh, aim was to industrialize uh, the, the country. But at the same time, one uh, culturally speaking, we could see a, s a huge gap between westernized population, um, that is the tiny min minority of the population back then, and uh, the overwhelming majority of the population who uh, was uh, still very much uh, close to religious values. Um, and, and so we could see these contradictions between, on the one hand, um, cultural uh, policies of uh, the Shah's regime uh, to kind of westernize and modernize Iranians, uh, and at the same time, uh, the majority of the population, uh, which was holding to these uh, uh, religious uh, or uh, traditional uh, ideas. Okay, I think that's a really, really good picture you've painted there from personal experience as well, of course. Holly, let's remind the viewers, if they're in any doubt that the country was ready for revolution, 98% of people in a referendum, whether those exact figures are credible or not, but 98% of people in a referendum at that time chose to establish an Islamic Republic. Can you just talk us through those moments of the success of the revolution and its early days and what people were looking for? I know that in the diaspora, there's a lot of discussion about whether this was actually an Islamic revolution. Um, oftentimes people will say that the Islamists hijacked the 1979 revolution. But when you look back in history, when you look at the chants that people were chanting, the signs, there was this sense that they wanted an Islamic Republic. And what they didn't understand at the time was that it was going to be the Islamic Republic that we see today now. They assumed they were going to get a lot of freebies. I mean, at the time, there were talk of freebies such as oil and free housing and electricity, and there would be equality and that things would be different. And at the time as well, um, um, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini said he didn't want any um, role in the future of the government, which obviously ended up being the opposite because not only did he create the Velayat of Fahri, he also led the country as supreme leader. So I think at the time people were naive and hopeful. They were caught up in this enamor of change that they were going to get rid of what was then assumed to be a police state under Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. And so when this election happened, uh, they voted and it got in the high 90th percentiles. But what it meant was that they didn't know what it is. They just voted for an Islamic Republic. Iranians neither knew what the details were. And as time went on, it became fact that this is not what they wanted. If you remember closely, for some of our viewers, on Women's Day, the Iranian, some Iranian women in Tehran also went out to protest the imposition of hijab. So some, there was a lot of kisms as the revolution progressed. But in the end, the big winner here was Khomeini and the Islamic Republic. OK, so one more question about history before we examine where we've come in 40 years. Uh, 
Sehan, every revolution needs a philosophy. You know, it might be populism, fascism, communism, whatever it is. It was an Islamic revolution in Iran. Would you agree with Holly that it was just a question of change and that it became an Islamic revolution? And how would that then reflect on what the country is today in terms of the people who are still around who wanted that change 40 years ago? Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't really agree because you wouldn't, agree, uh, you wouldn't imagine someone like Ayatollah Ruhullah Khomeini, a politicized scholar, having any idea other than an Islamic government. He wrote it in his book. He said it in his speeches. So he had in mind this idea of an Islamic government. The shape of it, the form of it came later on. But he always carried this idea of an Islamic government in one way or the other. This is, uh, of course, one significant part of the story, I think. And, uh, but yes, I agree that, for example, the Iran revolution of the uh, 79 revolution wouldn't have taken place had two things wouldn't be there. The first one is the irrational policies of Mohammed Reza Shah. Uh, he was mistaken on a number of issues, I think. For example, his ultra-secularist policies was one of them, that he couldn't cope with the growing uh, uh, urbanization in the country, growing demands or the urbanite classes. Uh, that is an, uh, another significant fact, that he couldn't remove the huge income gap between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, these are true, but the other, uh, I think, significant part of the revolution is that the idea that the problems could be removed by a regime change, it was there. And the leftists agreed on it, the Islamists agreed on it, and the nationalists agreed on it. And the only man who had a clear idea about the best viable uh, alternative was Ayatollah Khomeini. And he always carried this idea of an Islamic government, again, in one way or the other, all the way from the beginning, I think, at least through the 70s. Okay, Saitara, you're the only person speaking to us, actually, from Iran. So you'll know that in the past 40 years, there's been a continual struggle between the theoc theocracy and the reformists. And the theocracy keeps winning. How is that struggle today in Iran? Well, I should uh, make this point first that uh, the reform, the reformist or the reformist party was not exactly the opposite of the theocracy. They were the ones who wanted or so, who sought reforms within the theocracy. And uh, the personalities that you see sit at top of the reformism, reformism are, um, I mean, are represented by many of the clergies, including Muhammad Khatami or um, Sayyid Hassan Khomeini, uh, who actually was also um, a grandson of Imam Khomeini. I should also mention um, that um, I think it's not very fair to call uh, Iranians' aspirations for a change as, change as uh, naive. I think uh, actually Iranian people very, were very sophisticated in what they wanted, and uh, as your uh, expert in the studio also mentioned, uh, they found that Imam Khomeini was uh, the only uh, leader who actually had a very exact idea uh, of uh, what an alternative government would be to replace the Pahlavi regime. People were really fed up with the inequalities, the social injustice, and um, the brutal uh, policies of the Pahlavi regime. And as for uh, many revolutions, uh, well, it is true that many of the ideals of the revolution have not yet been fulfilled, but the aspirations for fulfilling those ideals uh, still exist among the people. And this is this uh, dynamism among the public and this uh, uh, support for the general, for the overall establishment that makes them come, uh, take to the streets every year um, and, uh, and come to the polls to, uh, you know, cast their... Uh, votes and take uh, to uh, to play a part in their uh, political decision making of their country so it's i think it's very important also to remember that for 40 years the revolution has survived despite all the hostility that it has received from uh foreign powers including the united states uh, and we have gone through wars we have gone through sanctions and uh uh, obviously, like all other countries, we have also had domestic problems, including um, economic problems. Seth Ray is saying that people are part of a democratic process. I'll just read you a small quote here. 
Uh, it's a gentleman called Sade Zibakalam, a political scientist, scientist who won a Freedom of Speech Award last year. He spent two years in prison under the rule of the Shah. He supported the revolution. He says, the revolution promised us democracy, the rule of law, and freedom of the press. It promised us the right to freedom of opinion without being arrested and tortured. That's very straightforward. How much of that exists in Iran today, Azadeh? Well, unfortunately, um, you know, the revolution has uh, had three major demands and promises. One was freedom of uh, press associations and so on. The second one was social justice. And the third one was independence. When you look at freedom, unfortunately, it has not been achieved. Uh, several thousand uh, political prisoners have been executed in Iranian prisons. Uh, uh, several uh, thousand others are imprisoned right now, including bloggers, journalists, uh, uh, women's rights move, uh, 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 activists, human rights activists, and so on, or, or activists for the environment. And uh, then if you look at social justice, you can see that the gap between the rich and the poor, that is the richest and the poorest, has never been so important uh, than now. Uh, and of course, to this is added economic crisis, part of which has been aggravated by American sanctions, uh, and the only uh, slogan or demand that has been achieved uh, is Iran's independence. Foreign policy is independent. Uh, but my question is whether this, this foreign policy is, very, is really to the benefit of the Iranian population and our country or not. Uh, so this is an open question. But when it comes to freedom, unfortunately, this promise of the revolution has not been achieved. And I agree with uh, my colleague, Dr. Zibar Kalam. Uh, as they, uh, it's your special subject. What's the situation like for women in Iran today? And obviously, then we'll hear from Setare, who's actually in Iran. Well, I call it one step forward, two step backward, the situation of women. Of course, women took active part in the revolution. And thanks to their participation, they could maintain their political rights that they have gained under the Shah. Nonetheless, when it comes to the civil court, to the penal court, for instance, uh, it is based on a very traditionalist reading of Islam. And uh, to the point that Iranian society has become really modernized, if you go to Iran, rate of uh, literacy, uh, the number of stud uh, female students in universities is 60% uh, uh, of all university students, that is over 3 million uh, girls are now in Iranian universities. Uh, for instance, the average number of children per woman, which was eight at the time of the revolution, is only 1.7 today, even less than in Turkey, for instance. So we have a lot of social changes uh, in uh, within the Iranian society uh, to the point that um, we can talk about a really modern society, but when it comes to uh, laws, when it comes to institutions, they are archaic and they really do not match correspond with the realities of the Iranian society and okay. with the Iranian uh, uh, women's population. Setare, what do you say to that? You know, in the outside world, we see these social media videos of uh, young women protesting against the law that requires them to wear hijab, saying that we want to make our own decisions. That's a really powerful image that we're getting. Uh, what do women in Iran say? Uh, well, obviously, as you know, the mainstream media, especially in the West, uh, always highlight and uh, uh, kind of exaggerate the that those types of protests. I know I'm not saying that those types of protests do not take place, but um, as the polls show and as uh, you can observe within the society, still the majority of the women uh, do not have an issue with the imposition of a hijab because it was a part of the um, criminal law and the constitution that was uh, decided on uh, by the people. And if we are going to talk about democracy, uh, democracy is the rule of the people, the majority of the people. The majority of the people in Iran are still religious, and although there may be uh, various interpretation of uh, the Islamic law, what, they, what the majority still want is the, the rule of the religion and the rule of the, uh, the majority. Sure. Um, as someone who has been living, I mean, I have been born and bred in Iran, and um, so I'm talking about my own experience. 
uh, yes, there is a dynamism, there is a, uh, an, uh, an aspiration among Iranian women for even more equal rights and even more opportunities. But um, as for freedom, freedom, I think um, there is uh, this very famous saying that um, as long as there is freedom of thought, uh, or as long as people are practicing from a th freedom of thought, they will also seek freedom of uh, speech. And uh, so that women I, in Iran have been... Okay, do you mind? Yes. I, we are running out of time. Holly, can I give mm -hmm. you the last word? What are the big challenges 40 yeah. years after the revolution? What does Iran have to confront within itself? Well, I think the bigger challenges are the chance of what the protesters are saying since the December 2007, January 2018 protests that continue to ebb and flow. It's mismanagement, it's corruption, it's the state of the economy. Iranians are growingly disillusioned with the establishment. And the Iranian establishment has also recognized this to an extent. The daughter of the late president, um, Hashemi Rafsanjani has come out and said, we need to make these reforms or else we're going to end up the Shah, like the Shah. And so has President Hassan Rouhani. So while there is an acknowledgement from the upper echelons, the fact that they haven't addressed these issues, that they merely blamed it on the West and made minor reforms, but the fact that they haven't actually gone out and done something about it two years in, since these, over a year since these protests, I think that that itself is an attestment to some of the changes that need to be made. Having that been said, the Supreme Leader has said that they will be making these reforms, but we haven't really seen that happen. And so until some changes are not meant made to appease the Iranian people, I think that they're going to have to watch things carefully because not only are Iranians fed up, but they're also getting fed information from abroad about the state of their economy and whatnot. And so as long as they continue to blame the West and not address these issues, they're going okay. to have a bigger problem on their hands. And I'm not saying there's going to be a revolution or anything like that, but you're going to be seeing a lot more people on the streets in the near future. Azadeh, Holly, Setare, Serhan here in the studio. Thank you to all four of you for joining us on the Newsmakers.